All right. How's it going, Maribel? I think we are live. Okay. All right. Let's go to the next slide. Good afternoon, everyone. Bienvenido. I want to thank all of you for joining us today as we kick off the first of a six part webinar series focused on anti-racism. My name is Dr. Patricia Lopez. I'm assistant professor in the Kremen School of Education and Human Development at Fresno State. Um, I'm also the director of Enseñamos en el Valle Central, which has the honor of sponsoring this webinar series. Um, I'd like to open by acknowledging that we are on traditional lands of Yoku Manu Mono Peoples, um, the Fresno State campus where my colleagues and I gather and benefit from sits on the occupied territories of these indigenous people who hold an enduring relationship to the land that we have a responsibility to recognize. Um, I know that many who are watching today are educators. Um, I want to stress the importance of paying tribute to Native peoples and the original inhabitants of the lands we each occupy. Uh, this practice of recognition and acknowledgement of indigenous people and the ongoing process of colonization are steps towards raising awareness about the histories that are often suppressed or forgotten. These practices are also expressions of anti-racism and anti-racist epistemologies. Um, for those of you who are for the first time participating in an event sponsored by Enseñamos en el Valle Central, I want to just briefly share that we are part of a Title V developing Hispanic serving institutions grant focused on cultivating future educators with a commitment to equity, liberation, and justice. Um, a very integral part of this commitment is promoting culturally and linguistically sustaining and ethnic studies pedagogies that are grounded in an anti-deficit, anti-racist, and anti-oppressive frameworks. Value and service to community, political awareness, and critical civic engagement for the public good. The vision and principles that we uphold as an initiative are linked also to a long history of community struggles for access into the teaching profession and an education system that reflects the racialized experiences and contributions of those it serves. Today, this vision and our mission is demonstrated by the coming together of Fresno State scholars and faculty of teacher education who will help us to unpack K-12 expectations for future and current educators and in particular, debunk myths and anti-deficit, anti-racist, and anti-oppressive frameworks that are, um, that are not separate, right, from these K-12 educator expectations. Um, our panelists today are gonna highlight the finer intricacies of what anti-racism looks like for educators and provide tangible evidence and examples of these approaches in action. Um, finally, I want to briefly historicize and provide us with a shared definition of the concept of anti-racism. This concept has deep roots in abolition, the call to end slavery, and the call for structural changes and eradicating institutional racism in a post-emancipation society. These movements continue to persist today, most notably through the Black Lives Matter movement, whereby activists and educators alike specifically use terms such as abolition, anti-racist and anti-racism to underscore the importance of individuals understanding historic and ongoing racial disparities and how these disparities are deeply rooted in power policies and practices. These movements also remind us that we cannot heal a society of racism without pain or discomfort and that fighting racism and becoming anti-racist who advance anti-racist ideas and support anti-racist policies requires action. I quote Dr. Ibram Kendi who states that, quote, to be anti-racist is to deracialize behavior, to remove the tattooed stereotypes from every racialized body. On that note, I ask that we all allow ourselves today to take in this discussion, that the discussion inspires us to think differently about what is possible in K-12 classrooms and how educators respond to things like standards and expectations through an anti-racist framework. Uh, for those of you who are tweeting, we ask that you please 
use the hashtag enseñamos PLC um, and follow us and tag us on social media at FS Enseñamos. Um, and thank you again for being here. Um, I'm now going to turn it over to my colleague, Dr. Maria Goff, um, who'll transition us to the panelists. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Lopez. Um, because today's because the focus of today's webinar is anti-racism and teacher preparation standards, I just want to briefly introduce the California Teacher Performance Expectations, or the TPEs as we commonly call them. As shown on this slide, there are six TPEs. And within each of these, there are multiple elements that identify key points of each teaching performance. In our credential programs, pre-service teachers demonstrate their knowledge of the TPEs in multiple ways in their, uh, throughout the program. And as our panelists will discuss today, the goal for a pre-service and early career educators is to know that the objective is not to memorize the TPEs or to feel that your pedagogy needs to be driven by the TPEs as a checklist. Rather, our focus and our goal is to support and remind you about the importance of embodying an anti-racist teaching approach. Our panelists today will guide this discussion in the areas of clinical anti-racist practices, anti-racism and multiple subject, and anti-racism and single subject. For our crime and community, uh, please keep in mind that for those of you in the multiple subject, single subject, and education specialist credential programs, that our Office of Clinical Practice has approved these hours of participation in the webinar series as counting towards your required clinical practice hours. And you wanna bring uh, this content back into your courses and into your coaching conversations. And finally, at the end of our discussion, please complete the survey uh, through the provided link. And that survey will be required if you would like to receive the certificate of completion for attending all of our webinars. So we have three panelists today. Each panelist will have about 15 minutes to present. And during that time, you can submit questions. Uh, if you are on Zoom, please use the Q&A box. If you're on Facebook Live, we'll do our best to field your questions to our panelists. Um, if you have questions for a specific panelist, please note that in your question. And the panelists will answer questions after all three have presented um, for all of us. Our first panelist I'd like to introduce is Dr. Ana Soltero Lopez. Uh, Dr. Soltero Lopez is an assistant professor in the Department of Literacy, Early, Bilingual, and Special Education in the Kremen School of Education and Human Development at the California State University, Fresno. She teaches courses on culturally sustaining pedagogy, teacher inquiry, and undocumented students. Our second panelist is Dr. Heather Horsley. Dr. Horsley is an assistant professor of early childhood education in the Department of Literacy, Early Bilingual and Special Education as well. She is also the coordinator of the multiple subject credential program at CSU Fresno in the Kremen School. And our third panelist is Dr. Earl Aguilera. Dr. Dr. Aguilera is, the, is an assistant professor of curriculum and instruction at California State University Fresno. He is an award-winning teacher educator as well as an internationally recognized scholar on issues at the intersection of literacy, technology, and educational equity. Please welcome our first panelist, Dr. Soltero Lopez. Can you all see my slides? Mm -hmm. All right, excellent. Thank you, Dr. Ha for the introduction. Um, everyone, welcome. We're glad to have you. Um, what I wanted to start off with today is actually speaking about doing anti-racist work in clinical practice. But before I dive into discussing that, I want to actually start by sharing a little bit around my personality and my positionality, excuse me. Um, which really comes down to an abbreviated life story that I want to share, right, in terms of what brings me to this work. I migrated to the U.S. at the age of two years old and settled in a black brown community in Los Angeles. It didn't take long to experience the racist nativist that continues to play our nation today. I attended public schools where my peers and I were racialized and deemed incompetent because of the color of our skin and other characteristics. Though I couldn't verbally name what I was experiencing, I was highly critical of my teachers, 
my counselors, and the education system in general. I knew my peers and I were being failed by a deeply rooted, uh, deeply rooted racist and dis dysfunctional system. After graduating high school, I attended college with the mission to help upcoming generations of students of color and share with them all the, the information and resources I had gathered that had helped me move through the education pipeline. Um, I wanted to minimize the struggles that often right, plague our students of color. It was also through my studies in Chicana Chicano studies that I gained the knowledge to name what I was experiencing in K through 12. And that I continued to see in the numerous years of working in schools with teachers and youth in, in several, several contexts of the United States. The combination of my personal and professional experience are what inspired me to pursue academia. And for the last four years, I've had the privilege of working at Fresno State within the multiple subject credential and, help, um, and teaching four of the core courses in that program. What I am sharing with you today reflects the explicit anti-racist preparation of teachers and support and allyship with their struggle in enacting this work in their placements. So first I wanna begin by articulating what is on this poster and let me pause to, to read it. It says, non-racist versus anti-racist. Not being racist is not enough. Not being racist is not allyship. Anti-racism isn't a belief. Anti-racism is a set of actions. Anti-racism is calling out racist actions, words, beliefs, and structures every single time, no matter who they're from. Anti-racism is allyship. It's uncomfortable, it's active, it's constant, and it's where we're going to make change. And I wanna contextualize this again with the focus of what I'll be sharing with you in terms of clinical practice. Likely, many of you are joining us in this first session because you want to do or you're trying to do anti-racist work in your schools and may face criticism or feel ostracized by your peers, right, for taking this particular stance. And I am glad you are here and I validate your commitment to anti-racist teaching. You are not alone. Your beliefs and values that celebrate the cultural and linguistic diversity of your students should be unapologetic. This is your teaching philosophy, an opportunity to take an anti-racist pedagogical stance. So why do I bring up this idea of a teaching philosophy? Likely for those of you that are still in, in our credential program or in a credential program, this is something that you may be doing in coursework. And this is absolutely something you will all do when you are on the job market. Right, and a teaching philosophy statement and it's kind of simplistic definition. It's a self reflective um, and conveys your beliefs, values and pedagogical stance about teaching and learning and it informs your em employer of the criteria and standards for which you evaluate yourself. Right. I want to emphasize that this is about how you evaluate yourself um, by providing concrete examples of your teaching eff effectiveness. Um, the ideological challenges and clashes some of you may be experiencing or have experienced is rooted in this. Everybody's differing philosophies of teaching. So in particularly with teacher education programs, there are several folks that you work with that influence, right, um, your development of a teaching philosophy. You have your credential program instructors, right, like myself and my colleagues, your mentor teachers, those that are hosting you in their classroom, right, to practice what you're learning in your program. And then you have clinical practice coaches, right, who are guiding you and giving you feedback as you teach, and then district staff. And going back to this idea of a teaching philosophy, we have to recognize that veteran teachers, administrators, coaches, um, even instructors, right, uh, professors, are products of teacher education programs from several years ago to even decades ago that were arguably less responsive and explicit about racism and other isms. We are in a different time reflected by the, the, um, the current uprising in support of Black lives and other social justice issues. 
In my time working with multiple subject teacher candidates at Fresno State, these are some of the examples that I hear every semester in response to assignments I give that are student-centered and rooted in youth empowerment. So I have examples that kind of reflect some of these different um, uh, stakeholders. Uh, the first one reads, I love to enact culturally sustaining pedagogy in my lessons, but my mentor teacher does not allow me to deviate from the scope and sequence of the district curriculum. Comment, let us know if this is something you hear um, or are continuing to hear. When it comes to our coaches, um, I often hear things along the lines of, my coach asked me to focus most of my lesson on content and not community building activities with my students. And then we have, um, when it comes to district personnel, principals, and other people that our candidates work closely with, I often hear things along the lines of, my principal was unhappy to learn I have to do a youth participatory action research project for my credential coursework. I was told to do it during lunch or after school. So these again um, are things that many of you may hear, may have heard. I want to also say that this, these are things that even graduates of our program continue to hear. I meet with um, students that have graduated from our program to continue help them navigating right this, this political time as well as these challenges. And I want to connect it to um, Dr. Goff's um, outlining of the six TPEs, right? By no means do the TPEs preclude you from doing anti-racist work, right? That is somehow, um, that message somehow gets, gets conveyed to teacher candidates and it's, there's no basis for it, that, right? That is inaccurate information that I think for a lot of our candidates, it kind of uh, deters them from doing this work. And I wanna also highlight something that um, the Enseñamos Initiative is committed to, which is not only bringing and um, strengthening the pipeline of bilingual Latinx teachers in the Central Valley, but we're also actively mindful about working with educators throughout, right, throughout the, um, the K through 12 pipeline, high school teachers, community college, university instructors, and more recently this summer we worked with coaches. So those that are, you know, providing feedback in the clinical practice. And part of the work that we did was very unapologetic, as we mentioned. We talked about racial linguistics, we talked about um, racism, we talked about community cultural wealth. And one of the activities that we had our coaches complete was have them write a clinical or a coaching philosophy statement. And I know that there's a lot of text on the screen here, but I really wanted as much as possible to um, uh, keep the authenticity of this statement that one of our coaches submitted. So I want to read it out loud. Uh, my clinical coaching philosophy rests on the premise of making not so much um, an expert in my field, but a partner in the coaching process. Some see such an approach as a liberation strategy in which coaches are no longer the single source of pedagogical knowledge, but rather are engaged in helping students move from passive recipients to active creators of pedagogical ideas. I validate students' pre-existing teach teaching abilities and skills and engage them in a critical look at the world in which they teach and to encourage them to see themselves as actors in the teaching arena, a world where thoughts and ideas have both potential and consequences, a coaching philosophy whereby student teachers will know that it is a partnership formed in order to give and receive feedback and to support and facilitate, facilitate professional growth through increased self-reflection. Coaching is not an evaluation and does not certify a student teacher's effectiveness. What the student teacher will attain will be the following benefits. Companionship, shared ideas, non-judgmental feedback, fine-tuning, transfer of skills, structure for continuous follow-up, collaborative problem solving, self-analysis, and the development of a trusting atmosphere for continuous growth. I instill the belief that racism exerts a downward force on the achievement of students of color that must be met with active anti-racist teaching. So I provide this um, coaches coaching philosophy statement 
to let you know that there are there is active work being done right there's active recognition for a lot of us in various capacities in the teaching field to pause and reflect about our our context right what is happening around our world what is happening locally in particular with um, the impact on our youth and there is commitment from folks like this this um, coach who is aware right of the impact of the power that they have when it comes to working and interacting and providing feedback to our teacher candidates um, what i want to close with is the importance of establishing and or finding right support with like-minded colleagues i can't stress this enough right particularly with our recent graduates i know it is a struggle many of us those of us on this panel know it is a struggle to do anti-racist work to do student center work when you have all these um, key players right instructors you have mentor teachers district personnel coaches kind of pulling you in multiple directions and it is a tricky um sort of landscape right to navigate right the, the pol political ideologies surrounding us in terms of teaching and learning um, another important note is know your worth right i've worked with many students that have completed our program that have been unhappy with placements or jobs that they've secured in the central valley and have looked elsewhere um, which which um, actually i want to direct you if you're not yet aware of a, a people's education conference there are two chapters in our state in the bay area there's one in oakland and in los angeles and there's amazing work happening in those two areas, right? If you don't feel like there's a fit, again, that honors your teaching philosophy, you are employable in multiple places, particularly now with districts being more responsive and recognizing that a shift is needed, you can get a job, right? And you are, you're valued for your stance. Um, another um research that i want to share with you all through the national organization ara there is a critical educators for, so, for social justice special interest group both the people's education conference and um the critical educators for social justice group um, are comprised largely of educators current k-12 educators if not recent educators right or um, former educators i should say and it's a great um these are two just two examples of great spaces where you can find community get ideas for resources um, how to navigate right the political landscape when it comes to clashing uh, political ideologies so now i want to uh, pass it over to my colleague dr heather horsley who will be speaking to you about um, anti-racist work in the uh, multiple subject credential. Thank you so much. <laughs> Is everyone seeing the slides okay? All right, thank you. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah, um, well, uh, I really uh, feel very honored to be here today to really uh, continue my journey, really uh, positioned uh, more aligned in my history from a dominant group uh, within my whiteness and understanding my development uh, in my white identity and understanding my whiteness and, and really thinking about how that brings me uh, to the work I'm doing with all of you here today. So we're gonna shift in this part of our uh, webinar to thinking about anti-racism work with some of our younger children, thinking about what this looks like with elementary students and how we're pre preparing uh, our student teachers to take on an anti-racism framework in uh, kindergarten through eh, about eighth grade. So I'm going to start a little bit uh, positioning myself and give you, you a sense of my journey and uh, what I'm bringing to the table. Uh, my past experiences definitely shape you know, how I interact with students, how I think about being a coordinator of the multiple subject credential program at Fresno State. And I, when I think about this and how important it is for, for me to examine uh, who I am it's so important because I can even have good intentions that have really 
unintended consequences. First, I'd like to sh start with a little bit of a story about my first kind of, I feel real understanding of race and racism. And it's a very personal story uh, that actually, when I started to think about it uh, as preparing for this webinar, it was very visceral. I could, it was almost as if I could smell the air again and, and the feelings of it. And, um, and it was truly embodied in me. So I'm actually taking us back to when I was about eight years old. And I was with my aunt and my grandmother and we were at um, my grandmother's first supermarket called the Safari in Yorkville, Illinois. I have half of my family, it lives in a much more rural part of Illinois. And then uh, on my mother's side, actually, I was much more uh, in Chicago. Um, so I was kind of uh, lived between the two worlds of the rural and the cityscape. Uh, and so this story takes us to more of the rural part of my uh, family experience. And as I was saying, I was with my grandmother in the car um, and my aunt, and I, we had finished shopping, we were driving around to the front, and there's that crosswalk um, that pedestrians as they come out with their shopping carts are to have the right of way. At that time, a woman and about a teenage um, child, a uh, young person, uh, came out of the store and started to cross into the intersection as we were also approaching and trying to pass through. My aunt actually uh, rolled down the window and yelled out, um, hey, watch it, N-word. Um, I immediately stopped uh, what was going on and I told her um, that you know that those are harmful words and that I don't want to learn those things and that if I tell my parents, they're never gonna let me see you again. So uh, what I learned at the age of eight was that I have some position and privilege with my whiteness to shame. And I know that's a little harsh to think of it as me shaming my family, but it was really also me trying to uh, raise awareness with them as well. And over time, I have to say, that's been just a, a stepping stone in my own developmental journey. Uh, when we think about white identity and whiteness, uh, there's multiple layers to this and steps. And it's never something that you arrive at, at fully understanding your whiteness and your privilege. It's constantly evolving and new experiences uh, require that we continue to reflect. And with that, it's really important and something I with working with uh, youth of color, especially around grassroots organizing for social justice issues back in Chicago in particular, is just to see them as the ones with the knowledge and that they are helping me learn and we're learning together, we're sharing in that. And that when I get it wrong, it's okay sometimes to get it wrong. And I'm really speaking to the white folks that are on, the, on this webinar right now. I just wanna be clear about that, um, to hold that cultural and so I'm still left thinking a lot about how white supremacy conditions me. Um, I, I, I see it creeping in sometimes into my thoughts and how I think. And so I provided here a few ideas around how white supremacist ideas are conditioned into a lot of my experiences and probably many of all of our experiences. And I'm constantly trying to push into rehumanizing practices so that I can see when I reflect on, did I try to control too much of that situation? How do I shift to thinking more about it from a compassionate uh, perspective where I'm developing more openness and I'm not holding myself. Uh, perfectionism often gets held as a white supremacist conditioning as well in, in white communities and how to be more vulnerable and say, I got it wrong and own what I did and do better next time. And then Mr. Rogers, um, my background in education, uh, this is a wink and nod to the fact that I was a, uh, a first started in early childhood centers and then moved into teaching in public school in first grade for several years back in Chicago. And he tells a story about how when he was a young child, his, uh, and, his, and he would be scared by things that were happening. His mother would always say, look for the helpers, 
you will always find people who are helping. And I really think that what he's trying to help me also understand in this is that I need to be the helper and I need to be thinking about um, the ways in which how I'm positioned now in this leadership role in this credential program to make sure that we are in great partnership with with moving forward with this anti-racism framework. Now I'd like to share a little bit about some framing and thinking about how um, you can apply an anti-racist teacher education um, framework to your to your experience and really thinking about how the context and your looks that you bring to this work kind of wraps around all of these components of curriculum and clinical experience in our program and that we really this parallels often in our in our k-12 system when we're thinking about uh, developing our uh, lessons and our themed experiences for children from an anti-racist framework that we want to really think about those concepts and the big ideas that are of real interest and deeply rooted in the local knowledge and communities and that um, that we're really thinking about how all these need to be kind of working together to fully pull together an anti-racist framework and with that the focus of today that we wanted to really bring with you, to you was the teacher performance expectations. I'd really like to uh, think of them as tools, uh, as a tool for us to uh, how we grapple with the purpose of education and what we do in practice and what that really looks like. I wanted to share a little bit with you that I've been deeply influenced by this concept of reality pedagogy by Dr. Edmund Emden. Sir of Science Methods uh, Education at Teachers College, Columbia. And I just, um, one of the things that he really shares and helps us understand is the importance of seeing our classroom spaces as places for co-empowerment. Empowerment for us as educators, empowerment for the students um, so that they can really name what they're seeing in their lives and transform it. He also just recently, I'll make sure you have that resource. And here's one of his um, texts that uh, you may want to look into in the future as well. Fresno State in the multiple subject elementary education program. I have two cases that I want to use to illustrate how anti-racism uh, frameworks are completely complementary to helping people become teachers and using the teacher performance expectations uh, to help support and make that claim. So the first case example I have for you is um, a, one of our uh, student teachers who was in the internship working during the day already in the district and then would take courses with us in the evening. Uh, she was placed in third grade classroom um, and she's in a much more rural part of the valley uh, in, in this region. And so uh, with this, she knowledge um, with work, sorry, not knowledge, uh, interest in trying to hear about how the uh, students, what, what issues, what ideas, what things in their, in their lives were they observing and seeing. And with that came up a lot of questions and thoughts about homelessness. And so that's really where her uh, puzzle of practice, uh, something that they would work together through inquiry to kind of resolve or come to a different understanding became the focus of their work. And she even built in after that with her students as co-teachers and co as um, co-researchers uh, wanting to understand also um, addiction. And so again, just really uh, the important part is it's a big idea, big concept that has a lot of relevancy because it's student driven and it's based out of what they are seeing around to the table. And what, what they ended up developing, which I'm gonna uh, see if I can switch for a minute just to show you a clip of the, um, of a video that they created, just so you can get a flavor and sense of um, 
kind of their end product and what they put together as they develop this work. So here we go. Over 1 million people in the United States are homeless. 1,000 people in the city of Fresno are homeless. 38% of people who are homeless have used alcohol. Ways expressed are homeless or be drugs. 1% of homeless youth under the age of 18 are abusing drugs and or alcohol. This, this is serious and it is only getting worse. This is a problem. People start using drugs for a bunch of different reasons. Sometimes some people get them on their lives. Some people just want to try them. Sometimes some people see other people do drugs and they think it is okay. Sometimes some people do not go to school, so they do not learn not to do drugs. This is not funny at all. This is very serious. Sometimes homelessness causes people to do drugs and drink alcohol. Some people get out of prison and have nowhere to go and cannot find a job, so they get mixed up into bad things and even start doing drugs. They foster care, they have nowhere to go, and either give up and start doing drugs or end up in bad situations and do drugs. This is a deadly cycle. Homelessness? Leading to drug abuse. Drug abuse leading to homelessness. It never ends like ever. Help put a stop to this. Or at least lower the numbers. Switching back, everybody. So as you've heard in the video, uh, they get, they, there's evidence that they're gathering data together, information to put, put, uh, to put forth some evidence about what they were learning about homelessness and its connection. As the video goes on more fully about um, like different things that they can do as a community uh, to solve this, as well as um, uh, they had some fun at the end and they did a lot of dancing. And so we'll make sure you have access to the whole video. Um, this group of students and their teacher was rec recognized by uh, Fresno County Superintendent of Schools uh, as, uh, and the Fresno County Superintendent of Schools was so supportive that they actually uh, were saying that they hope more, more teachers will do inquiry projects like this with their students. And so teacher performance expectations. You know, with all of these projects, there's a lot of behind the scenes work with planning and uh, 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 thinking about your beliefs, thinking about, you know, um, the types of standards that you want to bring in from K-12. You want to bring a full set of your strategies. And so there was about 10 lesson plans to really go into how this teacher was doing this inquiry project with her students. And with that, we can really see how her development as a student teacher uh, is, example, TPE1, engaging and supporting all student learning uh, so that they are applying knowledge of students, including their prior subject matter to real life context. And then one thing that I think is a really great way to use the TPEs is more formative and think about asking our, our student teachers, okay, here, you know, it could be in this TPE three, for example, understanding and organizing subject matter for students. Which sub TPEs do you think um, you explored and where would you think your growth in that The second example is a case of a, a puzzle of practice around uh, STEM identity development. It was multiple grade levels of students because as Dr. Uh, Soltero Lopez pointed out, this was a situation that to lunchtime, 
um, because the mentor teacher again was still struggling with understanding the value of the of the project and so they decided to open up the project to multiple grade levels and, and encourage the work to be much more collaborative and what the students wanted to do because uh, they paired up on this work was introduce uh, a space for students to engage in STEM based activities. And with that, they developed a website and they collected a lot of documentation. Uh, they really wanted to start with the questions of where, where do their, uh, where do the elementary children see themselves in terms of like having a science identity? Like what do they think about science? And one of the things that these uh, student teachers realized was that because of how the K the K eight and what counts in terms of testing at the state level, that the students were getting very little time with science engagement experiences, and the the students themselves basically said that they don't really know <laughs> what because they never really get to explore it in school. And so uh, again, with this project, we can link it to the teacher performance about TPE1, engaging and supporting all student learning. It had a lot of universal design of learning components. And from there, really thinking about TPE6 and asking, once again, the student teacher themselves to use the TPEs as a tool to reflect on their formative development over time and think about what TPEs they're exploring and how they feel they're growing. And lastly, I just want to point out a few considerations in uh, having an anti-racist approach in elementary education. You definitely want to think about this from a developmentally appropriate standpoint. Uh, you know, in kindergarten, you may really lean on early literacy and have a word wall that has words like fairness, uh, equality, uh, even justice. Young children, especially with rich literature around them, can uh, grasp those concepts. Uh, you also want to think about leaking your anti-racist teaching to standards. Again, it's hard for a school district in some ways uh, to say you're not doing teaching well if it's already linked to the standards. And so that's one way to offer some buffer that I've used even in my own practice. Um, know your worth, demonstrate your worth, you know, really believe in the transformative work that you're doing and um, dive in, reflecting and learning from it. And also think about ways to invite families into the co-inquiry partnership, help as allies in this work and continue to ask these questions. What purposes should the cur curriculum serve? How is that knowledge selected? And who gets to decide? So now I'm gonna pass it off to my colleague, Dr. Aguilera, so that he can focus more in on the TPEs and the secondary school level of the single subject credential. All right, uh, thank you very much uh, to, sorry, is that sound coming through okay? I have to pause for a second. You're good, Earl. All right, cool. So uh, first of all, thank you very much uh, to Dr. Saltero Lopez and Dr. Horsley um, for highlighting these really important uh, approaches and ideas. Uh, and thank you, of course, to all of the uh, folks that are joining us here uh, in this webinar in uh, this very busy and challenging time uh, in our lives. Uh, we really appreciate your presence and we really appreciate you uh, being interested in, in continuing this work together. Um, it's important work that needs to be done, um, but it's work that can only be accomplished when we move uh, together. And so uh, we're going to shift our conversation now, as uh, Dr. Horsley alluded to, uh, to older students, uh, specifically uh, considering the relationship between anti-racist teaching practices um, and single subject 
uh, teaching performance expectations um, along with common core uh, content standards. We have another webinar that's uh, specifically designed uh, looking across the subject area. And so we'll leave you here again with some more general ways of thinking about this in your uh, everyday uh, teaching practice. And so before we jump uh, back into content, um, I wanted to share uh, just a bit about where I'm coming from and what brings me to this work. So uh, in this image taken, oh gosh, let's see, about 13, I think 13 years ago, uh, myself uh, in the blue shirt and, and uh, my brilliant colleague, Will Childs, are, are getting hype with the Philadelphia Freedom Schools, uh, in particular at, at Potter Thomas Elementary in North Philadelphia. Um, if folks aren't familiar with um, Philadelphia Freedom Schools, it grew out of the Children's Defense Fund um, Freedom Schools movement, which itself grew out of the Freedom Schools established during the Civil Rights Movement. Um, and so what you're seeing here uh, is part of, I guess, what is now uh, commonly referred to as, as morning meeting, um, but which we at PFS back then referred to uh, specifically as Harambe. This was a time for our older brothers and sisters in the program, and that really was our honorific, right? We were called brothers and sisters. It was a time for us to show um, our scholars, our younger students, how excited we were about reading and math, uh, and to invite our scholars to share their own excitement as well. And so from the earliest days of my teaching, I've been involved in community-based uh, activist, Afro and Latinx centered curriculum, uh, though I soon transitioned uh, into sort of more established uh, institutions for high school teaching, along with their standards, their curriculum, um, and of course their professional teaching expectations, all of which um, are informed by their own politics, cultural perspectives and ideologies. And I think it's a really important point um, that we as a panel and as, uh, as a group really hosting you all want to stress, right? That the standards themselves, right? And the, the TPEs themselves are the product of a cultural perspective. There is no such thing as a culturally neutral way to look at any of our work as teachers. Right? All that we can do is try and be as transparent as possible about the cultural and historical and social perspectives that inform the ways that we look at the world and the ways that we teach. And I'm sharing all of this today just to ground a little bit about where I'm coming from. Um, and even though at this moment, um, I'm surrounded by colleagues who are in many ways taking the lead uh, in a lot of these essential areas of, of anti-racist teaching. Um, I too have had as a teacher, right, to negotiate um, many of the issues highlighted by Dr. Soltero Lopez, uh, Dr. Horsley, uh, Dr. Goff and Dr. Lopez. And so while I'm sharing these lessons that are grounded in uh, evidence and are grounded in a shared sense of who we are as educators. Um, I also want to specify that a lot of this just comes from my own teaching practice and my own experiences. Um, and to a degree, a lot of the different challenges that I continue to wrestle with today um, as both a teacher and a teacher educator. But enough about me. Uh, as a group, we wanted to close today's presentations and transition toward our Q&A uh, with a series of provocations. Uh, now, while the idea of a provocation, uh, I know can sometimes come with negative connotations based on how dominant cultures and institutions in the US have framed it, um, I invite us to think about the idea of a provocation in the ways that other educators, uh, such as my colleague, uh, Tran Templeton, have framed it as an invitation of thoughts uh, ideas and actions that can help to expand on another thought, a project, an idea, or an interest. Um, and so keeping that in mind, we want to begin our provocations with uh, the words of James Baldwin, who delivered this talk following the nationwide uprisings just after the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Um, I'm going to drop a couple of links into our chat transcript, um, one of them uh, being, let's see if I can pull that back up, uh, where is our chat, there we go, uh, one of them being the link to the actual YouTube video that we're about to share, uh, 
Uh, so you all can, uh, if you don't want to watch it on the webinar or if the quality starts getting choppy, um, you should be able to watch it on your own computers. Um, and then the second thing I'm going to drop into the chat is a transcript of the video. So again, you can choose to follow along uh, even if you don't have video or audio connection or if you just prefer to keep the focus on, um, on the webinar. Uh, importantly, just a, sort of a tech aside, um, if you click that link that I just dropped uh, to the transcript, it should ask you uh, whether you want to make your, uh, yourself a copy of that document. And if you click yes, you'll be giving your own copy of that document to use as you need to in your own work. And so as we watch and we listen together, um, to these words, to the words of James Baldwin. Um, we'll engage, I'll, I'll invite us to engage in, in what has sort of become, right, a commonplace practice uh, in teaching, uh, reflecting on the questions, what do you notice um, and what do you wonder? Also, a quick content warning for language. Uh, so just be aware uh, that there is language in here that, that may uh, be triggering uh, racially. So if that's an issue, uh, just kind of keep that, uh, keep that in mind as to whether or not you want to keep us, uh, keep the webinar not on mute or if you want to watch the video on your own time. Uh, and moderators, if you could please help get these links onto the Facebook live chat, that would also be appreciated. Uh, I turn the floor now back over to, uh, to James Baldwin. There we go. The reason that black people are in the streets has to do with the lives they're forced to lead in this country. And they're forced to lead these lives by the indifference and the um, apathy and a certain kind of ignorance, a very willful ignorance on the part of their co-citizens. Everybody knows, no matter what they do not know, that they wouldn't like to be a black man in this country. They know that, and they shut their minds against the rest of it, all the implications of being a black father, or a black woman, or a black son. And all of the implications involved in a human being's endeavor to take care of his wife, to take care of his children, to raise his children to be men and women in the teeth of a structure which is built to deny that I can be a human being or that my child can be. The great question in the country has been all the years that I've been living here and I was born here 43 years ago is what does the Negro want? And this question masks a terrible knowledge. I want exactly what you want. And you know what you want. I want to be left alone. I don't want any of the things that people accuse Negroes of wanting. And I don't hate you. I simply want to be able to raise my children in peace and arrive at my own maturity in my own way in peace i don't want to be defined by you i think that you and i might learn a great deal from each other if you can overcome the curtain of my color the curtain of my color is what you use to avoid facing the facts of our common history, the facts of American life. It is easy to call me a Negro or a nigger or a promising black man, but in fact, I'm a man like you. I want to live like you. This country is mine too. I paid as much for it as you. White means that you are European still. And black means that I'm African. And we both know, we've both been here too long. You can't go back to Ireland or Poland or England, and I can't go back to Africa. And we will live here together, or we'll die here together. And it's not I am telling you. Time is telling you. You will listen or you will perish. 
All right, so sorry about those those YouTube cards um, toward the end. Um, and so kind of just taking a moment to reflect on those, uh, that speech uh, that we just watched and that hopefully is in front of you. Uh, and if you haven't actually had a chance to visit the transcript document yet, um, I'll invite you to please do so. So please go ahead and click that link to this transcript in the chat. Um, and uh, the reason I'm asking us to take a look at that is because I've included some reflections at the end of the transcript for reflection and discussion. Uh, and these are for students, right? These are questions for students. Uh, they're not for us to spend time on now, uh, of course, unless you want to in the Q&A, um, but they're designed for a ninth and 10th grade audience to consider alongside this speech. Um, and what you'll also see on that document toward the end, I commented them out on the side, uh, is you'll see some notations for the different common core state standards in uh, English language arts. Um, and that goes across writing, uh, speaking and listening, uh, reading informational text and reading literature. Um, and so here then is the first of the provocations we'd like you to think about. Uh, as we wrap up our panel presentations and shift our focus back onto your teaching practice, um, and it is this. Uh, we're asking you first to review uh, the California teaching uh, performance expectations for beginning teachers, specifically the one that we've displayed here, uh, TPE 3.3, which reads, uh, beginning teachers will plan, design, implement, and monitor instruction consistent with current subject-specific pedagogy um, in the content areas of instruction and design and implement disciplinary and cross-disciplinary learning sequences, including integrating the visual and performing arts as applicable to the discipline. And just in case it's helpful, um, I'm gonna drop that in the chat as well. Uh, this is TPE 3.3. This will link you to the full document, by the way. Um, and so, what we'd like to invite you to think about is this, in what ways do the teaching materials that I've just shared, uh, in what ways do these reflect this particular teaching performance expectations? And in what ways do these materials reflect commitments to anti-racism? And when I mention teaching materials, I mean all of them, right? The video, the transcript, and the questions for discussion and the different kinds of activities I've suggested here. And these are not very different than the kinds of questions I've asked my students, whether it's in their ninth grade uh, English language arts class or in their 11th and 12th grade um, English language uh, uh, AP course. Um, Oh, sorry. Here, uh, here's the next uh, provocation we'll ask you to think about as we wrap up um, our panel. And it reads, uh, thinking in particular about uh, TPE 4.8. And actually, let me drop that into the chat as well. And again, if we could make sure these get to our Facebook friends, that would be powerful and very helpful. Uh, and the performance standard says using digital tool, oh, sorry, uh, beginning teachers are expected to use digital tools and learning technologies across learning environments as appropriate to create new content and provide personalized and integrated technology rich lessons to engage students in learning, promote digital literacy and offer students multiple means to demonstrate their learning. And what we'll ask you to think about, uh, thinking about our webinar is in what ways are we uh, as, an org as a group, as a community here, in what ways are we trying to, are, are we modeling the expectations alluded to in this standard? And in what ways have our own practices reflected commitments to anti-racism? And last but not least, here is one final set of provocations to consider as we move into the Q&A session of this webinar. I focused on ELA standards and TPEs because that's my training and that's the current context that I work in. Um, but what, uh, in what ways might this work in your own context, right? So the provocations read, what could you do 
with the instructional materials uh, and approaches like this in your own content area or grade level? What adjustments would you need to make to better fit your community context? Uh, in what ways can anti-racist instructional materials, teaching practices, or sorry, materials and teaching practices work in tandem with common core state standards, TPEs, and other professional standards? And finally, what is our role when anti-racist commitments and professional standards seem to be in conflict? Uh, I've got a slide here that you can, uh, you'll have access to uh, after the webinar, just a couple of additional resources and references from this talk in particular, uh, if you'd like to access more work around uh, James Baldwin, um, more work around the way that uh, students across the country um, are talking about race. Um, shout to Gene Demby and Shereen and Marcel Maraji on the Code Switch team for providing that. Um, and then a resource from Teaching Tolerance on discussing topics of race, racism, and other, other difficult uh, topics with students. Uh, and so with that, I know that was a lot that we've thrown out here in the past hour or so. Uh, and so from here, we will invite you to turn your thoughts uh, to our Q&A discussion. And I uh, will turn the microphone back to our amazing moderators for this session. Uh, thank you all very much for listening. Thank you so much, Dr. Aguilar, Dr. Horsley, Dr. Soltero Lopez. Um, it's been great reading the chat and reading the Q&A. Uh, we have some really good questions for all of you to field as we, we move on. Again, if you are tweeting, go ahead and, uh, and link us or use the hashtag in your tweet as well. Um, the first question we have relates to uh, clinical coaches, so clinical coaches um, here at Fresno State. Um, so if appropriate, can you tell us more about your clinical coaches? Are they employees at the university and local schools or a little of both? What opportunities for learning are these coaches being provided? Um, and they all said, thank you. So whoever wants to take that, take that on. I'll speak to that a little bit. So, um, so our university coaches are uh, typically come with a lot of or administrators of about 20, you know, 15 or 20 years of experience. And then we also have some coaches uh, that are currently still in the field as teachers and still are in practice, so to speak, supporting our teacher candidates or student teachers. Um, as far as uh, they are hired uh, through the university um, process, we have you know, searches for it, uh, a whole process for reviewing their applications and making decisions around that. And then to the last piece about ongoing uh, development uh, for our coaches, we do uh, in the multiple subject program host uh, a, a coach learning community where we like to bring forth, um, you know, helping them understand what's going on in the curriculum side of, of things. So sometimes we'll have faculty come and share information about their coursework and these frameworks that they're bringing up in framework or culturally linguistically sustaining uh, practices framework. Um, we also look at data together and uh, really reflect together on our practice through that learning community. Also, um, Dr. Soltero Lopez, I don't know if you wanna mention about the wonderful work that the Enseñamos project did with the coaches just briefly Yes, yeah, sure. Thank you, Dr. Horsley. Um, so the, the quote that I shared towards the end of my, my presentation um, is a quote um, from one of our coaches. And if you haven't yet had the, to ha had the opportunity, I encourage you to check out um, the work that we're doing in the Enseñamos Initiative. Um, again, just to, to um, kind of briefly explain, our objective with this initiative is to produce our own bilingual Latinx teachers in the Central Valley. So given the emphasis on bilingual teachers, this summer working with Dr. Horsley, we decided to have an institute specifically for our coaches that work with bilingual candidates. And in that, um, in facilitating that institute, 
we were very intentional about talking about racism, as I mentioned, racial linguistics, things revolving around lang language, the racialization of language, working with teacher candidates, um, right, who are our first generation, who are um, uh, uh, English language learners. Um, and we, one of the assignments that I gave them was actually um, to write a coaching philosophy statement, right? And as um, I unpacked in reading that quote, there's many elements that for some of us, for many of us, maybe resonated in terms of our own teaching philosophy statement. So it's to, to Dr. Horsley's point is we're actively considering, right, beyond teachers, right, our candidates, I should say, working actively with our coaches, with our district um, partners, with mentor teachers, so that we can have these discussions around these, you know, quote unquote, sensitive or, or political topics. Um, it's time, right? Given everything that's happening, it's time, it's needed. And we want to make sure that to that end, because in my experience as an instructor in the program, it breaks my heart to repeatedly hear our candidates say that they've become disillusioned in the profession because there's so much clash, right, in terms of their ideology, their innovativeness. And so that's why, particularly with the Enseñamos Initiative, that is at the forefront of, my, of our mind, right? Making sure that we're working with folks like the coaches to slowly but surely start um, having people have dis discussions, conversations around the status of the education system, around our students, right, students of color, um, so that we are all, to some extent, right, on the same page in terms of ideology, right, in terms of pedagogy. So yes, right, we are working with our coaches um, and we'll continue working and reaching out to other um, key stakeholders, right, that, that influence and impact our teacher candidates. Thank you both. Um, just a clarifying question on the coaches. Are the coaches that you work with uh, pre-service teachers, supervisors, is that what their role is? Um, but with more of an intention behind the process um, than perhaps maybe sometimes happens uh, with other supervisors? Um, Dr. Goff, my internet kind of paused on me, so I missed some of the question. I apologize. <laughs> Sure, there is just a clarifying question on when we're, we're referring to coaches, are we discussing pre-service teacher supervisors? Yes, okay. Yes, that's Thank you. And I'll, I'll, just, I'll just quickly add that uh, commonly across several teacher preparation programs in the uh, uh, CSU, the California State University system, the common word and even how the CTC refers to it usually is university supervisor. We, in the last maybe three to four years, kind of shifted a mindset there that we really wanted to lean more into what it means more to be a coach than someone just supervising the work, even though part of being a coach is supervising uh, the process and development. Um, but you're also really uh, in that mindset shift with coaching we want to think about how you're coming alongside the teacher candidate and encouraging them themselves. Like I said in my example, ask them what TPEs do they are they working on or want to work on, and have them think about their growth with those with that knowledge and those skills uh, that are highlighted in the performance. Thank you. Um, the next question is it any either of you or any of you have any advice for someone who is thinking about being a community or continuation teacher so i don't know if this is just me i'm not actually super clear on the terminology like I, it's those aren't terms i'm familiar with so is there a way to get uh the original question asker to kind of clarify that a little bit it could be just me though I mean, if, if one of y'all know then feel free but that's the reason i'm being quiet yeah we can ask for clarification thank you um and then another the next question while we're getting clarification on that um 
do you have any advice for when you, so I'm thinking this is either a pre-service or in-service teacher, uh, experience parent pushback when it comes to anti-racist topics in the classroom? I was actually just speaking with a student about this. Is it okay if I, is it okay if I go? Yes, go ahead. Yeah, so the, the, the um, working with parents is interesting. And I, I was like literally on a Zoom call, not, not three days ago, right, with a student who brought this exact question to me. And I think there are lots of ways to approach it. I think ultimately, much of this comes down to, and this is, this is like terrible of me because I'm gonna answer this the way that I answer kind of any like management type question, right? Is that so much of it depends on the relationships that you've built prior to that moment, right? And how you're able to, to draw on those relationships to better inform the conversation. But if I could very weirdly sort of decontextualize things just for, for the sake of conversation, um, my general advice would be that when I'm, when I'm talking, when I'm approaching somebody with questions about the curriculum or questions about curricular choices or pedagogical choices, you know, one of my go-tos in, in recent times has really been focusing on my role as a teacher, right? And, and my role as a teacher is largely to present the world, right? And the way things happened, uh, which may include the realities of race uh, to my students. Uh, while I bring a particular worldview uh, to the classroom, that's not necessarily the, the, the way that I should or need to approach all of my students, right? And so if I can share my, uh, with my students uh, as closely as I can, right, the reality of history, the reality of the world around us, uh, from as many different uh, cultural perspectives as possible, including, right, and, and particularly focus on, on the voices of um, underrepresented and minoritized individuals, uh, and then give students the tools to address those issues, that largely is, is my role as a teacher. Uh, and so again, that, that's a very kind of idiosyncratic approach. Uh, it's just sort of what I have tried to focus on personally as a teacher, but I think it's also important to hear other folks' perspectives on that. So, um, so that's kind of what I'll say to, in, in response to that question. Uh, one one I thought I had uh, in terms of, you know, oh, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Heather, go ahead. Yeah, um, just thinking about uh, laying a solid foundation for relationship building, how are you reaching out to parents on a regular basis so that it, it becomes part of the conversation, ongoing conversation. It's not just a, whoa, what, did ha what just happened <laughs> moment, but they understand, um, your philosophy and the purpose behind the work you're doing. And I, I believe when that relationship is stronger, you're able to then also ask them where their, you know, questions to reflect on together. You know, maybe we're misunderstanding their question. Like what is truly at the heart of what they're concerned about as a parent? Um, it could even be something that a parent might feel that the work of, that's being focused on in the anti-racism work, it's in their cultural background is just one example, you know, so rather than assuming they're coming from a negative place in the question, how can we open that up to not lean on those assumptions, but ask some opening clarifying questions to understand a little bit more of where they're coming at, coming to you from. Um, the other thought that I said before is that uh, it's always helpful to link it to your, to the state standard in a student teaching program, if you're a student teacher, teacher education program, that those teacher performance expectations uh, also offer support for you to kind of point to, well, I'm actually, this is like supported from the state <laughs> level as well. Uh, that feels a little like not as supportive, but it, it is one way just to assure them a little bit that you're not just doing this rogue, it, you know, you're not just going out on your own doing this, but this is part of a broader a broader 
approach is grounded in our standards for what we think counts for what children need to learn. I'm actually going to jump off of that that question because there's a similar question in the in the Q and A, um, which is which is aligned to that. Um, how can we handle situations where we teach at a school where teachers slash faculty who condemn um, anti racist racist teachings? So I think it kind of is in that similar theme here. I think going back to um, one of the recommendations I had, we understand that many of you do feel isolated, right? When, when your ideas, right? When wanting to do anti-racist teaching does get condemned by your colleagues, right? I know um, it's very common practice to have PLCs and work with grade level colleagues and so forth, right? Have your uh, principal kind of drop in. And so we understand that that's the reality that many of, many of you are likely experiencing. Um, it is important, right, if you can, and there is there are people out there, right, um, that are doing this work and are learning how to navigate that precariousness, right, of having to deal um, with multiple people, having to have, I, I had just uh, one of our recent graduates is um, having three evaluations done this semester and she's trying to engage in this work and she's very nervous about it, right? Because of course these evaluations are, um, are not announced. They just, they, they just drop in. But in speaking with her, she started kind of actively seeking support even across, right? In her, in her case, um, she works in her grade level team and um, again, found herself, you know, sort of being isolated and marginalized for ideas and started seeking um, support and collaboration with colleagues across grade levels and even across schools, right? In Fresno Unified, this is the district that she's teaching in. And I can't, I can't emphasize how important that is, right? Because again, you're not alone. What you're doing to the points brought up earlier, the state actually, um, our superintendent, right? Of California Department of Education is supportive, right? The language again in the TPEs do not preclude you from doing any of this work. To the points being made right now, I always encourage our candidates, as long as you root your lesson in your standards, typically in my experience, when my candidates have been approached, right, by folks that are uh, upset, either parents and or colleagues, usually folks kind of back away. They say, oh, right, Heather, I didn't know that you were using X, Y, and C standards, all right? That's actually really good, right? You want to be, um, you want to get to a point, and I know, again, this is easier said than done, where, again, very diplomatically, you um, assert your knowledge, right? You assert your knowledge and you um, advocate for yourself in what you're doing with your classroom, right? To, to Dr. Aguilera's point of, it's so important to establish community, not only in your classrooms, but with the families. Again, in most cases, to the point that Dr. Horsley brought up, I have had candidates and teachers express that, right? Oh my gosh, a teacher was, or a, a, a parent was super hostile to me, right? They wanted, you know, they were demanding why I was teaching X, Y, and Z. And usually when they explain, okay, here are the standards, this is how we evaluate children, your child actually on this unit is actually exceeding, right? Or performing, or I'm seeing growth in these areas. Usually, right, in explaining that to parents, Obviously, right, your, your colleagues would know that, um, but it, it um, assures them that, again, you're not kind of willy-nilly having conversations that are taboo or that you should shy away from, right? Another important thing, right, is that education is not um, apolitical. Everything and anything that we do from our, pedag from our pedagogy to the choice of our school districts choosing a curriculum, right, for example, wonders, that is political. So that's one thing that I always write, kind of have people think about because people think and are, are told that education, that schooling should be apolitical. And that's, in my opinion, absolutely false, right? There's no merit to that. 
So those are kind of some, some things um, to kind of consider, right? You absolutely advocate for yourself, ground everything in your standards, grounding everything in literature, right? I know with the courses that I teach, I actively engage my candidates, not just on best practices, current theories and, and things of that nature, but we engage in doing research, right? Cutting edge research that's coming out, that's telling us how to do culturally sustaining pedagogy with emerging bilingual students. There is research being, release, right, published constantly that is um, responsive to the times, right, to the needs of our students in our education system today. So that's another outlet, right, grounded in literature and research that's being published. Thank you, Dr. Sultana Lopez. So we have another question. Um, and the question is phrased, is intersectionality discussed in teacher credentialing coursework? Um, if so, how is it coached into the TPEs? So I think probably we want to, just for our audience and, and any candidates, just to make, make sure that we note that intersectionality is a component of critical race theory, which I think many of you spoke to. So just kind of putting that caveat um, in there, whoever wants to take that question. So I can, you know, it's, that's an, it's an important question to ask and to continue to think about. Um, and when, when we're thinking about um, sort of un understanding, I mean, the concept of, of intersectionality, right? Understanding sort of how are the different dimensions of our social identities, right? How do those intersect uh, across kind of different uh, sort of metaphorical axes to position ourselves, right? To, to operate in the world in, in different ways. That's a pretty, it's a very complex one, right? And so I think when we're, uh, whether we're approaching this idea with students um, in our K-12 classrooms, or whether we're approaching this idea uh, with our teacher candidates, there's sort of a lot of pieces that need to be in place uh, before we can even get there, right? Understanding the idea of identity as socially constructed, right? Or at least one dimension of identity as socially constructed. Um, understanding that the categories and the labels that we put people in, uh, whether they be racialized ones, whether they be uh, economic categories, um, whether they be gendered categories, right? Those themselves are also socially constructed based on things that as a society or as a dominant culture, we've chosen to pay attention to uh, while we've chosen not to pay attention to other things, right? We've decided uh, that skin color should be the basis of how we racialize people. Uh, we may have decided that the accent that one speaks in is the basis for racializing people, but we haven't decided that eye color or, or hair color, right, or hairstyle should be a basis. And yet those are all biological, uh, biologically determined, right, in the same way that skin color is. So I think I, I can only speak for myself because I teach in the, uh, I teach one of the courses that's a prerequisite to the single subject credential program. We do get there eventually but a lot of what we work on, at least in my coursework, is just the building blocks that help us to really understand the idea of identity as socially constructed and positionality in the world. Uh, without necessarily using those terms right away, but knowing that eventually we do need to, to get to them with, with all of our students, because that, that language right, gives us a way to see and understand and act in the world um, in a way that not having that language um, may render a lot of these things invisible, right? As Dr. Soltero Lopez uh, alluded to, right? This idea that all of this is political, all of this is informed by our perspectives. A lot of that is, is, is rendered invisible by dominant culture. And sometimes we need the words uh, to, to render these realities so that we can talk about them, so that we can argue about them, so that we can challenge them, and ultimately so that we can dismantle them. And just to share a little bit about our multiple subject credential program, we actually have a series um, that the students take for the duration of their time in the credential program, and that's the um, inquiry and puzzles of practice. And in that series, actually, the faculty get looped with our candidates. I've taught um, all three of those courses and looped with several cohorts of students where, um, as I mentioned earlier, that course really is rooted in um, establishing uh, not only a teacher identity, but a researcher identity, right? 
and have them, have them navigate kind of um, traversing both teacher and um, scholar identity. And in that series, we do introduce and we do read critical race theory and unpack inter intersectionality and what that means for their context in, of teaching and learning. So we do do that in the multiple subject program through that series. Thank you. And I'll just add, I'll actually put on my, uh, my faculty hat really quick and move out of moderator, just to add to what Dr. Aguilera had mentioned. Um, I teach the social foundations, which is phase one for the teacher credential. And we, um, and the course is fundamentally designed to talk about um, these very foundational um, theories, concepts, and then move them in um, looking at introspectively from the personal and then structurally um, how they play out in schools and various institutions. So a lot of what Dr. Aguilera mentioned that the seeds he plants early on um, I get to further water them a little bit when we get into phase one and the um, social foundations course that explicitly unpacks some of these issues. Um, and then I'll go on, this actually transitions nicely to another question, which was related to, there. it was asked a couple different ways. First, how are anti-racist teaching practices informed by ethnic studies knowledge? Um, and the history and communities um, pushing for ethnic studies. Um, and then in another question similarly related was a question for all of us, I think on here um, are the backgrounds. Did ethnic studies, was it ethnic studies, I'm trying to find the wording, was ethnic studies integral for any of our, any of us in our journeys that brought us um, to where we're at today? So I'll let the panelists go first. So I, I am a product of um, ethnic studies. As I mentioned, I majored in Chicano Chicano studies as an undergrad and proceeded to um, do my master's and PhDs in education with an emphasis on race and ethnic studies. Um, and to the question around the influence, I think absolutely as I shared um, in sharing my positionality of, of a, a brief kind of um, story of my trajectory, um, I know that if it wasn't, you know, me taking that Chicano studies class my very first quarter as an undergrad, I don't know that I would have felt as empowered and I don't know that I would have been as resilient as I was. Um, as I mentioned, I went to, a, a, you know, and I grew up in a community that was completely kind of disregarded and we learned, right, it was very little that our teachers actually taught us anything. We kind of played and, and did non-academic stuff while I was in high school. So I was, um, I was not prepared for college, honestly. And so I went to college with the mindset that I would fail. I went and I was like, at least I tried, but I know I'm going to fail. And I didn't fail, right? I completed um, my degree with honors. I did two majors and two minors, but I really credit that not only to Chicano studies, but the mentors, right, that I had, faculty and grad students, and also um, me being really grounded in the community there. Um, I went to UC Santa Barbara. I think that was um, crucial for, you know, my ability, right, to, to maintain resiliency and, and get through undergrad and continue on to graduate school. Um, I think, I, you know, as I mentioned before, it was because of Chicano studies that I learned about critical race theory, that I learned Latin crit studies, that I learned about oppression, that I learned about all these things that I had identified as a youth, but I didn't, I couldn't name it and I couldn't, I couldn't root it down in right, like the infrastructure, right, of this country. Um, ethnic studies, I mean, as you can all probably tell, I'm a huge advocate of ethnic studies. I think that um, it's unfortunate that folks still continue to silence. I know I'm seeing folks making comments around um, celebrating that Fresno Unified adopted the ethnic studies. Um, the Cal State system, right, will now have a, a requirement of one ethnic studies course. So slowly we're seeing um, some shift there, but folks are still in many ways trying to water down the true essence of what ethnic studies is. And I think that in particular to our context today of teachers, 
I wholeheartedly believe that all teachers should have an ethnic studies background, right, for numerous reasons, regardless of your person of color or not. I think it um, provides you the, um, the knowledge, the history that we don't get in our K through 12 schooling, right, that you can then use to teach, right, to build community, to celebrate the rich diversity of your students. Um, so yes, it's, it's um, absolutely beneficial, it's important, and I think that we need to do more, right, to, to push for more ethnic studies across the education pipeline. Is that applicable to anyone else? Any of the panelists? Um, I guess I could, uh, I minored in um, African American history, uh, US history. So um, I don't think that I fully feel that I identify within a full, full experience of ethnic studies, but I definitely um, deepened my, uh, my understanding of the very um, diverse history and experiences of Black Americans in this country. So, um, so that's a little bit about my my background and my undergraduate experience. And do you do you feel, Dr. Horsley, that 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 within your your story that informs much of how you look at things? I know you mentioned some of that in your presentation, but that it kind of is a ground it grounds you. Most definitely. And um, I think that there's also, you, you know, some of you may have, <laughs> this may sound <laughs> a little strange, but there is a between um, trying to always look to people of color to help predominantly like white <laughs> people understand diverse experiences. And that can be really taxing and problematic. And that we have to, um, I don't want to speak for all white folks either, but for my position, <laughs> we have to push ourselves to really do the work ourselves. And by uh, engaging and taking coursework that maybe others wouldn't is one really great way to do the work for yourself. Um, and I kind of think about it how sometimes uh, some professors put on their syllabi, you know, before you email me, uh, and when you do to ask a question, can you show me three things you did to try to figure it out on your own? I think a lot of white folks need to try to do that for themselves before they turn to um, to people of color to help them understand the world and <laughs> and and do the work. What three things have you done to try to deepen your knowledge before you look to others to tell you what you need to know? Thank you. That's that's great, Dr. Worsley. That's a great um, comparison there. Um, I'll just quickly share having that shared experience with Dr. Soltero Lopez. You know, for um, for those of us who come into this um, with an ethnic studies area studies background, we often say that um, we're part of ethnic studies and we just happen to be in education rather than being um, education folks. And this, so there's a very important nuance. And I think that speaks to the essence of the question that was initially asked. And um, it surely does um, definitely root, um, it, it, it grounds a lot of the, quite frankly, everything, everything in the way that we understand and the way that we see that body of literature has contributed profoundly to how we understand the education system um, and what's possible, which I think is you know, the theme of this presentation in particular when we start thinking about what is possible in K-12 classrooms. Um, there are other questions and I just, I know that we can't get to all of them, but just to give voice and like acknowledgement to the questions um, that were mentioned about, um, we have the mention of AB 1460. I wanna thank um, folks for mentioning that and making that connection. These are all very integral. And so I think in the presentation, um, just to kind of moderate what, what the presenters brought to you were explicit, an, a, a very explicit and intentional way of thinking about um, how you take an expectation and it's on us for what we do and what grounds and what informs um, how we approach that expectation. So surely 
um, having backgrounds in ethnic studies, area studies, which are fundamentally connected to these early disciplinary arguments, um, pushing for issues of abolition, anti-racism, anti-oppression, um, that the examples are very much tied to that same sentiment that when we're preparing future teachers and we're supporting them, we're coaching them, we're being creative with them, that we never allow them to relinquish that that is still um, possible. Um, so I think that we got through the questions that were posed in the q and I don't know if anyone has any last minute um, questions here, but um, let's see. There was a question, if we wanted to show Baldwin's video, so maybe Dr. Aguilera, if you want to speak to this, um, if, if we wanted to show Baldwin's video and others like his that may have sensitive words such as the n-word in our classrooms how can we do so without being offensive to the students also how could we handle situations where a parent or staff member fights this type of lesson we spoke a little to that earlier is there any legal issue that we may encounter either to protect us or go against us when trying to teach this type of material mm, man thank you for asking that and thank you uh dr lopez for highlighting it for giving voice to that question uh I mean, that, I, I love it and I'm so excited to, to see the question because it was like literally, it's like my entire <laughs> career as a high school teacher, right, is, is addressing that challenge. And so uh, I guess to come at it in a couple of ways, and, and I think it's also important uh, to, to leave space for the rest of our panel to approach. Sorry, I'm just trying to find it in the, in the chat. So, um, so one approach, I think, is to consider Baldwin's speech in the context of the rest of the literature and the rest of the histories that our students are exposed to, um, not just in their English language arts classes, right, but in their history classes, in their science classes, in their mathematics classes. Uh, and the, the, the way that Baldwin's speech fits into that broader body of literature. That literally is a common core standard, by the way, right? Looking at, at the seminal documents. So I think that's one, is it's situating within the context. I think another way to think about it as well is the texts that the students are exposed to and the perspectives that our students are exposed to that are explicitly racist and explicitly traumatic to students. In many ways, we don't bat an eye at those, right? Because some people sort of label them as as more of a a microaggression, right? And and that's a you know that itself can be a challenging category because it ain't micro to us, right? What, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like when you're making you know when folks are are making comments in front of colleagues and 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 dismissing and traumatizing people of color, that's not micro to us. That may be experienced you know for other people as 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 micro. So uh, from an English language arts perspective, right, one of the first places I go is to look at the literature of, of Mark Twain, right, and how Twain has been celebrated in the canon, uh, and yet himself uses not just problematic language, but problematic descriptions, right, of American life that, again, in the past has been written off as, oh, that was just the time, right? Well, I, listen, the reality is racism is racism, right? It doesn't matter what context, what time period you find it in, right? Maybe it was a time when people ignored it, but that doesn't change the reality, right, of, of, of what's going on. So that's another, I think, way to, to think about it, too, another angle to come at it. And then um, a third angle uh, I'd suggest is, is to really drill down on the notion that context matters. Um, and I'll, brief, I'll give you a little bit of behind the scenes for this talk, what I chose from Baldwin, that was the compromise. That was the clean speech that I chose for you because I could have picked another one. And so uh, I think coming, coming back to this idea that, that context really matters, who is using these words, how they're using these words, how you're positioning them in the classroom, how you're positioning students to take up or not take up these perspectives is also really important. And I, and I, and I, want to leave you with that thought because as a teacher 
those are the decisions you've got to make, right? These are the decisions you've got to make when you're not being observed, when the principal is not in the room, when it's just you and the students. So much of this is about framing and helping people understand context. So those are just three kind of different angles to come at it with. Certainly not uh, the be all and end all in the situation. But again, I'm trying to speak to you uh, from where I'm standing, right? From the position I've come from and the position I continue to, to inhabit today. It's very limited, um, but hopefully it gives you a bit of a starting point for thinking about how you might approach that in your own context. We actually have one more question now that we've gone through in the Q and A. Um, it's saying that they, you know, they love that we're using the word coach and that there is a strong and that there's a strong program behind it. So it's a, an accolades and kudos. Um, do you know if any other CSUs use that model? Is this consistent? Do you know, Dr. Horsley, is this a consistent term in the CSU? Actually, um, I believe that we may be the only CSU using the terminology of coach and made that shift. And um, I'm trying to think, I mean, really when I engage with other um, faculty and coach, um, well, supervisors or just people, coordinators across the CSU for teacher education, pretty much in all those meetings, I hear just often the word supervisor. And then it's usually I have, they ask the question, you know, what do you mean by coach, you know, and things like that. So that usually cues me in that they're not really operating out of that, um, out of that framework or approach to clinical experience. Um, I do say that we usually also add university coach with it because one thing is the K-12 districts have more often moved into a more into the concept and using coaches, uh, especially in, in their induction stages. Like I know locally Fresno Unified, uh, they have induction coaches. Um, and so sometimes we, that, I think some programs prefer to say university supervisor or supervisor, so it doesn't get confused with induction coaches. But honestly, I feel that theoretically and practically, there's more research and evidence that if we can sometimes the power of language right in itself that we rename this and we reconceptualize it and then we figure out how we put that into practice is more powerful to shift to coach than to keep it in this more transactional there's a, a real hierarchy i'm supervising you uh kind of experience of clinical practice Thank you, Dr. Horsley. All right, so it looks like we got through all of our Q&A. Um, I think I'll just make a really quick plug for our next webinar. Um, if we can shift the, the slide over. Um, so the next webinar we'll have coming up on September 24th, um, and we'll have Dr. Crowell from Sociology and Dr. DeWalt from uh, Kremen Liberal Studies. Um, and they'll be talking about the issue of anti-Black racism and teaching anti-racism. So we'll further unpack um, the issues that, that the panelists today kickstart. So please RSVP, um, same RSVP link. Um, and yeah, we look forward to seeing you then. I'll hand it over to Dr. Goff, who will tell us a little bit close us out with um, the survey information again. Thank you, thank you um, everyone. So again, uh, you, everyone has the opportunity to earn a certificate of completion uh, in conjunction with attending all of the webinars. Um, so to get that, you uh, are required to complete our exit survey. This also provides us with great feedback about our webinar series uh, going forward, if there's any adjustments we need to make. Um, so the, we'll link this in the chat as well. I'll drop that in there right now so that you can uh, access that and complete that. You'll also see at the beginning of the, the survey is a um, consent. And so we just want to be able to use some of your survey answers in uh, 
potential research that we might do as we go forward with this uh, learning series with, with each other. So um, I don't know, uh, Dr. Lopez, if you want to close us out, but I just want to say thank you so much. I know um, this is an ongoing learning process for everyone. And when we started off by saying, you know, you don't uh, get it right the first time, we are building on each other's knowledge. And so I appreciate this opportunity, not only to work with this incredible team of uh, panelists and everyone from Enseñamos behind the scenes that's making this happen, but also from all of your questions uh, through the chat and the Q&A uh, throughout this webinar have been fantastic. So thank you all. Thank you, Dr. Goff. Yeah, I, I completely echo that sentiment. You know, these are things and issues, the questions continue to guide us, to push us, to think more critically. Um, you know, this is an ongoing, right? Being, um, being anti-racist, you know, embodying these, these topics is a lifelong journey. And we're just grateful that you all for joining us today. We hope that you'll continue. We have five more webinars, we surely will unpack um, extensively a lot of other um, intricacies of this overarching topic. Um, we are seeing the, the chat comments. Uh, Dr. Goff is on it. We're going to make sure that we open up that um, survey so that you all can quickly jump on and, and just share your feedback. Again, everything that you share, um, we're going to take into account. You know, these are things that we want to make sure that, that we're continuing to, um, to support, to serve. Um, so thank you again. Um, please reach out. You have our um, information. You can email us at enseñamos at mail.fresnostate.edu. I believe I put that in the um, chat a little bit earlier um, and you can find us on the web. So thank you all. We look forward to seeing you um, in a couple of weeks. Good night. <laughs>